And a very good, if somewhat chilly morning to everyone listening uh, this morning here on the platform uh, on the information project. And uh, look, I, I went home from work yesterday afternoon and felt that the game was afoot, that we are certainly, uh, certainly in um, ele- the time of the election. And I looked on my social media and boy, all the... Oh, it is just hilarious watching, isn't it? People who are clearly deeply, deeply party, party political and partisan pretending they're not and making all these absolutely idiotic pronouncements about what this means or what that means or what the Nats are doing or what Labour are doing or the truth about this. And you just cannot believe that these political trolls on social media actually take themselves seriously. There's one guy in particular called Clint Smith who is literally paid by the Labour Party to spin for them. And he comes up with the most egregious, outrageous, rubbish, cold takes. But there are a lot of people, a lot of people at it. And of course, yesterday and last night on the news, you weren't going to get a lot on the latest political poll. Um, because all the major news organisations pay, um, I think it's about five grand a pop, for their own political polls, and they don't, they all say basically the same thing, um, and they don't want to cover other people's polls. So the Roy Morgan political poll, which is a little different, was out yesterday, and as we reported yesterday morning and brought you that news, it showed uh, a pretty big swing. Um, and, and let's just in broad terms say Labor down for National up for, um, and really the shape of the election starting to look like a change of government from a centre-left government to a centre-right government. But also very, very interesting in the Roy Morgan poll yesterday, I thought, was that New Zealand First, a long-time political party with, what, a 25-year history in New Zealand politics, but not currently in Parliament, was rating at 5%, which of course under our system of MMP is the threshold, the party vote threshold you need to qualify for seats in Parliament. Um, I texted Winston Peters yesterday in a familial, friendly way to say good result, and I got this text back and it said, oh, that's if you trust the Roy Morgan poll, and I don't. Grumpy response, I thought someone was out of the wrong side of the bed or not out of bed at all. But he joins us on video link now to discuss what is now a moving political landscape. Uh, Mr. Peters, welcome to the platform. I hope you're in a better mood this morning. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning. I was up since four o'clock yesterday morning, as I often are uh, these days. All right. And the second thing is, Roy Morgan uh, has never made it New Zealand first. And the third thing is, we've been around for 30 years. Oh, 30 years it is. Yeah. And as I said last Sunday, in a huge meeting in Whangarei, yeah. we're going to rise and the first thing to happen is watch the dirt that's going to come our way and that's exactly what we're talking about this morning. Yeah, yeah but Winston, I mean, uh, it was a rather perfunctory response to me, uh, which I don't mind, but you must, given the history of Roy Morgan underrating New Zealand First, you m- must be pleased with that result because it creates if you like, an impression that you are on on the comeback trail. I know you're going to tell me that all the meetings you go to tell you that anyway, but you can't have been disappointed with the outcome of that poll. Well, you're precisely right. But I have a long time as a long-standing person in politics, someone who's got a political science degree, I have been suspicious of the New Zealand polling system because it's corrupt. They have huge variations in New Zealand. They don't have it in first world democracies elsewhere. All right. Okay, but there it is. That's what we've got. That's what we work with. I'm presuming a read research is out in the next few days from what we've been, uh, people have been polled uh, with that. And most of our polls, accurate or not, do seem seem to follow the same trends. Um, Do you think we've kind of hit this tipping point in this campaign where those who were hanging on to the notion of a Labour victory, um, are abandoning them now? I have to tell you, and I'm saying it from a long time, long time observation, I've never seen a time where it's all for the opposition. They've got so much ammunition, nearly every on the arm these days. Yep. So much ammunition, but I don't think they've done well with it. And I don't understand why it is that 
I feel like saying sometimes, who's briefing these people? Who's advising them? Because they've got such an armory, an arsenal of, of issues they can be using, and they're not using them very well. Yeah. The polls are just too far too close. Yeah. Well, Luxon seems to be taking the Napoleonic approach, and that is don't interrupt your opponent while he's making a mistake. Uh, well, look, with respect, the announcement the other day on transport was actually, I, I looked at it and thought, how on earth could this happen? Because on the timetable of Puhoi to walk with, the policy they laid out to get to Whangarei would take 89 years. More, 89 more years. You see what's going wrong here? And I think people are going to start asking good questions because that's what politics and that's what good journalism is about. Mm. Um, the other thing, I guess, um, uh, Winston, we have had a plethora and all this sort of activity way at the margin of politics with all these genuinely, uh, generally right-wing or Christian conservative parties uh, setting up. We've got the umbrella group that Hannah Tamaki set up and they hooked up with outdoor recreation and then the New Nation Party run out of Wellington left them. Leighton Baker starts up. We've got Matt King, Democracy New Zealand. He's probably the most sane of the whole bunch of them. Uh, it seems to me there was a lot of, if you like, uh, marginal activity in that space. And, and from an outside observer's point of view, it's like you've come back not to that extreme space, but New Zealand First has come back and their protest voters and their uh, an unusual people, but their vote's as good as anyone else. I'd say you seem to be taking a lot of wind out of the sails of those minor parties that were never going to have any chance. For the alternate voter, uh, New Zealand First is a more credible chance of voting for someone who's going to get in. Well, you make a good point. What they don't understand, all these new fringe organisations, is just how tough it is to start a political party mm. and keep it going. It is hard work. It takes extreme sacrifice, lots of work, a lot of your own money. It's far more expensive than people think. And so they think, we start a party and this will happen. Well, it's not going to happen. They're all falling by the wayside now. And at the end of the day, uh, often they're single-issue parties. When politics is about a total aspects economically and socially of life. And that's the real aspect here. And But you should never categorise a political party's voters in the way that people start to do now. And I've heard it all my career, that the, the Labour voter is this sort of person, the National Party voter is that sort of person. No, there's a whole lot of people in, the, in between who, like Phil Collins saying it, want to hear both sides of the story. And that's the, those are the people who will decide this election. But Labour's going to fail because it's deserted for a long time, the working base of this country. They don't seem to understand the workers anymore. They've got this sort of inside the belt where university student politics about them and a lot of workers are, had a guts full of them. That's a fact. Mm. That's what they tell me. That's why in the countryside we're packing the halls. Yeah. And, and I want to talk about that because you have, I mean, you're old school, I'm, and I don't mean that as an insult, uh, Mr Peters, but you're old school. Um, and your way of politicking is you go out and you meet people in person. It's not memes online. It's not social media um, focused. It is an old-fashioned uh, campaign of getting on the road, jumping in the bus, pressing uh, the flesh. Um, do you think that's working? Do you think that's part of this, this uh, resurgence for New Zealand First? Well... You say it's old-fashioned, but no, it's not. I, I, you go overseas and you see people hard out on the road, they actually campaign. And what we've had in New Zealand over a long period of time, I remember Helen Clark, she used to get headlines going to a primary school and talking to the class. Now, that's the kind of media suck-up stuff that goes on, and I do not think it's politics. And They, they don't get the boat. The, well, about five teachers might in a small school, but the class, the classroom doesn't. Mm. But people want real politics. They want real people and they want uh, real issues. They want real answers. And you say it's old-fashioned. No, it's not. It's called democracy. It's called freedom of expression. Mm. It's uh, the old town crier saying, look, over here, this is a product. And you're out there talking to, guess who? The, yeah. uh, the people who on election day will decide this election, and it ain't me, and it ain't you, and it ain't the, the politicians. It's the ordinary people, and that's what makes politics exciting. Yeah. All right. Do you think you're getting a fair crack from the media, and do you feel you achieve this this uh, resurgence? Um in a hostile environment? Look, a week ago I said 
This is what I said. Look, I, but be warned, as we rise, the dirt will start all over again. Mm. In fact, as you know, it's already started, but that's a barometer of how well we're doing. But I was astonished to see, when you say getting a fair go for the media, I saw that article by Graham Adams. Now, I know the platform had him on, right? Yeah. You know what, you know what I thought was stunning? What? Here was this article where, for example, he was saying about hey, poor, poor that I knew, and all he was exposing to experienced experience journalist is his ignorance on the way it's parliament is run and cabinet is run. And Book Van Velden and um, uh, the, the woman Wade from TV3. Amelia Wade, Wade, yeah. Yep. Well, Amelia Wade were involved in a little conspiracy because they went to a meeting and they tried to test me up because they said, but Mr. Peters, you were at the cabinet meeting. Yes, I was at the cabinet meeting when the committee discussed this matter that came from the UN because of John Key signing up and something that yeah. I would not sign in 2007. But when the report was commissioned, it never came back to me. And I was, the, I was the foreign minister in charge of the United Nations material and it never came back to me at all. That's the truth. And then I had this kind of stuff. You were talking a little while ago about these people spinning for another party, in this case, a guy doing it for the Labour Party. This is what they're saying. They're saying Winston Peters' godfather co-authored it. One of his whānau co-authored it, according to a guy called Trevor Hughes, who was tweeting on the other day, and I thought, you muckraking twits, I'm going to get away with this. And I'm saying to Mr. Graham Adams, next time phone me and I'll explain to you and Brookbound Belton, who because of his newness and inexperience doesn't understand the system, that's how it works. You commission the work, but you don't approve it, and it never came back to me. And Willie Jackson confirmed that in the New Zealand Herald. Okay, you know, well, as you know, it's politics. People are entitled to their opinions and uh, not, not, by, not by way of a threat and, and in the kindest way, sue us. That's uh, <laughs> what I say. <laughs> <laughs> but at least well, we've given... And does win. <laughs> okay, at least we've given you the chance uh, to, to have your say. Look, the other thing I would say about your campaign, you have tapped into what I know is a active vein of discontent in New Zealand around issues involving culture and issues involving sex education. I saw a release or a social media post from you yesterday about this book, Welcome to Sex. Uh, Michael Laws did an interview with Bob McCroskey from Family First yesterday, an excellent interview which I recommend people listen to. Uh, This book isn't in schools yet. It has caused controversy in Australia and it is available online in this country. We have also had Chris Luxon come out in the last five or six days saying he believes like gender identity should be taught to parents in schools and schools should stay out of all this rainbow stuff. There's a general acceptance that rainbow activists have infiltrated our schools, counselling environment and community and are advocating and pushing homosexuality and transgenderism. Um... We've tried to get Luxon and uh, Erica Stanford on and, and Nicola Willis on to talk about this issue and they won't come on, which suggests to me that Luxon or National are talking the talk on these issues but not walking uh, the talk. Um, how important to you are these issues around, if you like, and it's difficult to find the right word, morality? or our, our norms in terms of morality and things like sex and gender and education and what our kids are exposed to. Is it just a little uh, minority interest thing or do you think there is a wider concern in New Zealand? Look, you put your finger on it when you talk about other political parties because I've seen their lack of action on this and I'm actually shocked as a, well, as a former primary school and secondary school teacher before I went into law, we used to know back then that the education was about education, not indoctrination. Now, the second thing is, we've always believed that the government has no business in the nation's bedrooms. But that said, this is active social engineering and teaching in the primary schools and else in the secondary schools without any knowledge and consent of the parents, who after all are the master in this matter. They've got fundamental rights in this matter, who've got obligations to young people in this matter. And they're just being sidelined in a most uh, callous, arrogant way by these social engineers. And I've made it very clear that uh, if we have any say about it, and we will, we're going to stop them in their tracks because they don't have any authority, any license, any mandate to be doing what they're doing. And some of the stuff is dangerous and it's outrageous that they were teaching it to children. 
and bending people's young people's minds before they're mature enough to make their own decisions. It's about young people's right to be free to make their mind up when they've got their experience and age to make their mind up. And stopping these uh, social engineers, as I say, without any authority in their tracks, and we will. Would you review the involvement of um, sexual lifestyle style lobby groups in government education pro uh, programs and in state schools? Because there are groups and charities which are clearly uh, gay advocates and lobbyists who are given government money to basically run programs in schools. I don't think they can be described as impartial or having the kids' interests first. You said, well, would we review them? Yeah. You, you, of course we will, because you've got to ask, what on earth is this going on? Is it legitimate? Now, I can conceive in some ways, if someone's being bullied in the circumstance, then that is a legitimate inquiry. But the moment it goes from licensed and legitimate to unlicensed and illegitimate, then that's what a review is for, and a review that, that finds out that things are being done without the permission of the parliament, so to speak, and the people of this country via parliament, then then review them, and if it's wrong, stop them. All right. Look, and the final issue, which is constantly brought up by those people I mentioned earlier, these people oh, who present again. themselves as experts on, <laughs> uh, on Twitter and say this and say that, and it still comes back, Winston, and, and, and I'm just giving no, you a chance to say it again. And it. here's the criticism, and you know what it is. He put Jacinda Ardern in power, and you can't trust him, and he might turn around and go with Labor. He hasn't really ruled them out. That is the one point that everyone's banging on about all the time. Do you he, wish to he, address that again? I cannot believe you're repeating that because you know you're repeating a lie. He hasn't ruled them out. That's a lie I have. Yeah, and have. I'm not going to go on someone yeah. who's more kept his word than any other politician that you know and keep on engaging with liars where they're talking about me. I know where it's coming from. Sadly, it's coming from those parties that will desperately need New Zealand first after the election. I know where this is coming from, and you know where it's coming from as well. Yeah. Um, I'm you're looking way, at, I'll ask you two just in broad terms. It does seem clear we're going to have a change of government, Winston. Look, I, what I was shocked by in those polls is how still close they are. At, between ACT and National, they're only at 46%, 47%. That's not a majority yet, is it? No. That's my stagnant, That's my point. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is 460,000 people from the National vote went across and voted for Jacinda in 2020, a myth and a waste of their votes, and they know it, and please don't blame Winston Peters. <laughs> I hear you. Come over. I Happy hear you. Um, well, I, I'll say uh, in a professional sense, congratulations to you on a good result and uh, let's see what the next one says. Uh, I thank you very much indeed uh, for your time this morning. I know you've been up since four o'clock. Thank is, you. <laughs> it's Winston <laughs> Peters, the leader of New Zealand First. And look, for all money, folks, they're on the comeback trail. Uh, normally, if you were polling at, I don't know, 4% right now and you, and you had the run-up they've got, the runway they've got, you'd say they're in uh, at 5%. And that's what you need to get. And look, it might be small. It might be two, three, four MPs. But uh, you just heard them say, oh, it's not a majority yet. Are we talking kingmaker again? So what did you think of that? What did you think of uh, where Winston's at? And look, I'm sure they'll all start spinning. Uh, also, if you're one of those people back, backing Democracy First Outdoor Party or whatever they're called, do you realise the dream's over, guys? That those minor miners are never going to get anywhere. If you want to have a protest vote, if you want to go conspiracy theory, Winston Peters is your man. He's your anti-vax party. Well, you can project your anti-vaxness onto him.